After having gone through several subjects in series, I thought that we must now as well come to discuss briefly the fundamentals and the principles of our faith. Although I do recollect that we have had lectures on this subject when we began this program about six to seven years ago. By that time, we were still in the old buildings and many brothers and sisters were not even able to attend, primarily because there was no room for many to sit and to be accommodated. Secondly, the program was still in its infancy. But I see that there is a need and for that matter, there is an urgent need for us to be aware that we follow principles and our fundamentals in a surrounding and environment which is not at all friendly. It is not even amenable, it is not even congenial not only that, but it is against Islam and it preaches values against Islam. And in preaching it, it also makes it look so plausible and so good that our daughters and our sons are attracted by it. Many questions arise in the minds and perhaps because of some scruple, people even don't ask and the questions remain unanswered. So we will try to touch upon certain aspects of the problems that we are facing and tackle the subject of our principles and fundamentals and faith in the light of those problems. First and foremost, Early in the morning when we have Gujarati lectures here, I'm trying to explain that <coughs> Muslims were the father of civilization and knowledge. I give instances from history to explain that it was Islam which encouraged search of knowledge. And the Muslims who followed into various branches of sciences, pioneered in the subject, became fathers in ophthalmology, in physics, in biology, in even astrology and astronomy, and in navigation, in the art of literature, in various fine arts, in calligraphy. In every branch of science, Muslims have had a lead. They laid the foundation and then there was a follow-up by the West. It will not be at all an exaggeration to say, and this is borne out by the facts in history, that when Muslims wore clothes and knew how to manufacture them, the European countries were going about practically naked. There were no civilizations worth its name here, and they know about it, and they even admit it. <coughs> what happened next is that as science was transmitted, knowledge was related, and people translated from Arabic into Latin and Greek, those things which lay dormant, thinkers in the West started developing which they called an era, an era of Renaissance or the era of rebirth. With that era of rebirth and Renaissance, when knowledge was supreme and mighty, there came several schools of thoughts which today have become the 
collective reservoir of thinking in the Western civilization. This is what we must understand. In the West, in England, for example, you'll find people, thinkers tell you that material is all in all, matter. Here again, you'll find people who will talk about capitalism. Money is all in all. Money makes the man go round. Here in England, you'll find people talk about communism, socialism, scientific socialism. Here in England, you'll find people talk about hedonism. That means whatever pleases you is good. Whatever engenders pleasure, good, follow it, because it pleases you. Here is liberalism. Here everything is a hodgepodge of several things which started with Renaissance. And one Muslim living in this country depends upon the confrontation, dep depends upon the meeting he has, who he meets, and he'll find that he is subjected to the preaching which is foreign to Islam and for one few minutes, few minutes, he poses and thinks these are two divergent and different roads, which one is correct, which one is wrong. It's a serious thing. Here we are told that man has got to be rational. And in the name of rationalism, we are being told that Islam, or for that matter any religion, is nothing but a package of nonsense. Because rationalism, whatever can be reasoned out. Here we are told that we must be pragmatic and empiricist. That means whatever can be proved in practice, whatever can be seen and touched and felt is true. The rest is all Humbug. Now tell me, the collection of all these thoughts can be reflected and is reflected in the newspapers, in the media that is television and on radio. Sometimes sit down to critically only analyze the types of programs being shown on television. And take a Sunday paper which has got feature articles and just analyze news plus review plus business articles. Just analyze to which category and to which division of literature these things belong. You will find that we are in a very subtle manner being told to leave all that which goes in the name of religion to believe in something which is pragmatic something which is empirical, so that we are practical people, and that's all. So much so, that there was a time when at least in the name of death, termination of life, people used to tremble and say, we are going to meet our Lord, we are going to account for our deeds. Death used to bring many people back to the fold of religion. Today, in a very subtle manner, there are two things being preached again and again. One, what is called in common language, mercy killing. If a man is suffering from terminal disease and the doctor knows the pain that a man is suffering from, therefore he must be dispatched. He, she must be dispatched. Because if you actually kill him, you are actually being merciful to him. One. And last night, in the news, a doctor was released and acquitted by the court. I, I heard it myself. Although he had prepared a suicide machine, which anyone willing could use, and if he, he or she used it, the moment she pressed the button and the drug went into his body or her body, heart would stop. That would be self-killing or suicide by intent, by assent. And a lady used it and she died and the doctor was actually brought to court and the judge acquitted him and said, 
it was a voluntary death. Not only that, but some ladies old, of old age commented on it saying that yes, this was the most graceful way of dying, now we know how to die. So you can see now, in a very subtle way, <coughs> the question behind all this is that there is a difference when I am a Muslim and when I say La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What we do not really understand and we should understand, but we don't really understand. That this formula of La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah is a very important formula. If a person wants to become a Christian today, he will be baptized. He will be taken to the church, baptized. Some water will be sprinkled upon him. Or if he becoming Jehovah's Witness, he will be submerged in water and comes out. And there are some chanting and all that. Perhaps becoming a Hindu, you have to wear a Janoi and so many things. But say you want to become a Muslim. There is no Janoi, there is no baptism, there is nothing. Say La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah and you are in the fold. Is it not so? But the condition is, say it with understanding and say it with your pleasure. No force, no coercion, no pressure can make you a Muslim. Why? <laughs> Just say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Because it has got deeper meaning. The moment I say La ilaha illallah, there isn't any, any existence worth worshipping but Allah Muhammad Rasulullah. And Muhammad is his prophet. At that very moment I accept one thing. That all the values, all isms, all ideologies, all idiosyncrasies, all that goes in the name of postulate, everything is batil and void. The only thing which is true is that which Allah has told me through Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a, it's a challenge. Now in practical life, the Prophet says, Allah doesn't want you to take your own soul. You can't kill That soul which has been given to you is the property of Allah. You are a custodian. You can't kill yourself. Whoever kills himself in whatever circumstance is performing whatever call is a dishonest man in the amanat or the trust in which he has been placed. And therefore, he cannot be pardoned and he will have to answer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having taken his soul. That is our. When I cannot take my own soul, how can a doctor decide whether dispatching me is mercy killing or not? When I cannot take my own soul, how can somebody else do it? Well, the principles, when the ayah came that whoever commits adultery, Surah Nur, second ayah, Adultery, whoever commits adultery, and if it is proved, because proving adultery is not a joke. But if it is proved, Allah says, whip them or give them the punishment of lashes. They must be lashed. How many lashes? Hundred. They must be whipped and lashed. Remember, I'm not talking, I'm not advocating Pakistan government here. Nor am I the advocate of Saudi Arabian government here. I know the conditions under which the lashes will take place. The punishment of Islam has been misrepresented by these two countries and it has been made a subject of joke. But when it becomes wajib for a hakim, a ruler, to apply this punishment, this penal code, and he will lash, people started telling the Prophet, <coughs> Ya Rasulullah, this is very severe. We feel pity. The third ayah in Surah An Nur is that when Allah tells you that punishment is due, in the name of Allah, there must be no pity. Just remember, see, 
There must not be kindness. When the punishment is due, that punishment itself is a kindness. Because when it will deter, it will save the society. When the doctor decides that your arm must be amputated, that amputation seemingly is very severe, but it is kindness in a sense, it will prevent the poison or whatever to spread further into your body. Who will decide? In the eyes of this country, and I'm telling you because I live now here for the last eight years, and because I read extensively, and I meet their philosophers and thinkers extensively, and we are in contact, and we know where we digress from each other, I can tell you that in the eyes of thinkers here who want to modulate the minds of the people, a man is a simple machine, just a machine. Just like a motor car engine. If it goes bust or anything wrong, call an engineer, he will just adjust it. A man is a machine, falls ill, go to doctor, gets himself repaired and walks again. Because he's simply a machine, therefore, the view, the viewpoint, the standpoint from which a man is studied is also mechanical. But in Islam, a man is not a machine. A man is an existence composed of spirit, soul and body. Spirit, soul and body. And is on his path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this particular travel. We are traveling and we are going to reach our manzil, our hadaf, our target. Ya ayyuhal insan, O man, you are struggling to meet your God and you will definitely meet him. Quran says. So when there is a body, so something has got to provide for the body. When there is a spirit, something has got to provide for the spirit. When there is a soul, there is something which must provide for the soul. And it is for this reason that all that goes in the name of pragmatism does not apply. Because even today we see ourselves that we don't only believe in things which can be touched and seen. There are things behind the curtain no one has been able to explain. Only Allah knows. They used to say that we in the East only believe in jinn, jinn. The Eastern people believe in jinn, they look like jinn, right? The Eastern people believe in superstition. We, we used to condemn ourselves. We people are backward, why? Because we believe in jinn. And also we believe in superpowers. We believe in Taviz. We believe in Dora. What is Dora? Daga. We, to some extent it was true. But gradually, under the same guise, <coughs> even those things which were real were classified as suspicion. Now we are told, we believe in Imam Hussain, we believe in Karbala, we believe in this, we believe in that. All that goes in suspicion. Because that which was real also has been intermingled with that which was unreal. Classification is done. But what does East believe in today? Jinn. Superpowers. And what does the West believe in? You don't know. If you don't know, someday come with me and I will take you to the club which is known as Black Magic Club. And I will show you what they are doing there. And you will be surprised. And they are not illiterate people, huh? The people carrying out those superstitious rituals are MAs and double MAs and doctors. And they believe in those nonsenses. There are houses here and also in Midlands, in Lancashire and Yorkshire which are not sold because they are haunted houses. Well, who haunts them? Jinnat. Yes, 
They are not rented out. If you rent a house, the neighborhood will start looking at your face first and tell you to make your will. Because in that house for the last 300 years, no one has lived. And whoever lived came out a skeleton. It's a fact. In this country, there are houses which they will not allow you to live in. And if you will persist and insist, they will ask you to make your will. Because this house does not allow anyone to live. What is the difference? You want to come with me, I'll take you too. Those people who believe that taking a pill or injection is to kill yourself, even if you are ill or sick, never take a pill and never take an injection. You'll be all right by prayers alone. Prayers. And someday I will take you to Christian scientists who believe nothing can cure you but Jesus Christ. Even if you need surgery, you may not go. Especially blood transfusion is haram in them, even if you are dying. What is this all? I sat with them again and again. The consensus is that, brother, we have gone through all the stages. Finally, we have come to understand that in spite of all the causes and effects that we know, there are certain effects whose causes cannot be determined. We haven't been able to find out how it happens. And when we came to know how it happens, we can't find out why it happens. Because these two questions remain unanswered in many cases, we are convinced that there is a power which is subtle, unseen, which acts and works. Well, so where have we come back? We have come back full circle. After all the civilizations and rationalism and whatever, we have come back full circle. Square one. So this is the reason why I say that do not be dazzled, over -owed by what you read in these prints. There is always a feeling of inadequacy, insufficiency in that outlook. And there is always a feeling of fulfillment and completeness when you are a Muslim and you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now look, my help today doesn't permit, otherwise I would have gone into details, but inshallah, I'll go into details to explain to you what goes on. When I say that the Prophet has told us that this is najis, do not eat. Please do not eat that food which is najis. Not only, I don't talk of only beer and alcohol and wine. That, of course, is a curse of God. Whoever takes those things is mal'oon. Fi dunya wal akhira. Who drinks, intoxicates. That man is right off. In Islam, if he says, I'm a Muslim, and I'm also going to drink, and I do drink, he is not a Muslim. The ahadith and traditions which have come up from the Prophet are so many and so severe that when I'm not allowed even to offer him a glass of water, and I'm not allowed even to allow his, him to, to marry anyone in my family, my daughter or my sister, I can't entertain his proposal. I can't consider him as my brother if he's a drunkard. I can't help him. That Islam which asks me to help a kafir to give a glass of water to a non-believer tells me not to feed and not to give water to one who drinks. So you can Im imagine the severity. So I'm not talking of drinking. I'm talking of najasat. Food, burgers, meat. When we came here, we were told, Mullah Sahib, that is halal food. And this is also halal food. And that is halal food. We came to find out not, not a single one was halal. When we asked them, they said, yes, it is halal. Halal means it is not pork. That's all. It is beef and lamb and mutton. It's not pork. 
अरे भाई जान वी वॉन्ट हलाल इट इज हलाल इट इज बीफ हाउ हैज इट बीन स्लॉटर्ड वो तो पाकिस्तान में रखा है यानी दैट बिलोंग्स टू पाकिस्तान डजेंट बिलोंग टू इंग्लैंड हाउ वॉज दैट स्लॉटर्ड दैट इज द मेन थिंग इन रेनस लैंड वी फाउंड पटेल वंस ओपन हलाल फूड हलाल मीट शॉप पटेल बिकॉज ही वॉन्टेड मुस्लिम क्लाइंट टेल and when we asked him he said yes it is beef and mutton but how has it been slaughtered ye to bhagwan jaane how does he know wo to bhagwan jaane it's a fact now on a sunday evening oh mulla to bakwas karta hi hai well you take your children and go to eat what is mcdonald Beef burger, is it? And nowadays it is so thick because I, I haven't eaten. I can assure you, but I have seen it on the advertisement. I don't know this, this double double kebab and with so much of salad in it and beautiful ripe tomatoes in it, so it becomes as bulky as that, and it is quite filling. when one takes one the hunger is over and it is being advertised on a sunday evening father and mother take the children and far children are innocent they have seen on the tv so they tell parents shall we have a burger and then they go and have feeding your children najis and haram both things together cakes and biscuits and breads and whatever where it has been clearly advertised that it contains an ingredient which is najis if it is not advertised you are not supposed to go and investigate but if they advertise and if you see there is an ingredient which is najis it is haram to eat and you want to feed your children those bread which i am sure that after it is ready on top of the crust the wine or whatever ahmed bhai knows better is spread or that cake in which wine is being poured while it is being prepared or that fried egg in the morning which is fried in lard and all that goes in the name of civilization and pragmatism mulla sahab what is the difference between a, a bakri and a suwar they are both animals all of both of them have got four legs and two eyes well so here is the difference this civilization looks at the animal as an animal four feet two feet it looks like as an animal islam does not look at it that way it looks at you a composition of body spirit and soul whatever you eat muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam said that it has an effect on your body on your spirit on your soul jism ruh and nafs every three every one of the three is affected by every morsel of food that you take if it is mubah it affects that way if it is mustahab it affects that way if it is makruh it affects that way and if it is haram it affects it otherwise islam or allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not have any personal thing to do or personal benefit to derive from preventing you for e from eating burgers which are najis But Quran says, "Kulu min al-tayyibat." Eat that which is tayyib, which is pure and pak. So, to them, you are a man, a man who drinks and drinks and drinks, gets rosy cheeks. Sometimes it is very easy to tell who is an alcoholic by looking at the puffed, red, pink cheek. Alcoholic. So the body 
mashallah became quite hefty and his cheek became quite puffed up so he is healthy what about his ruh what about his nafs and then preach unto him taqwa adala preach unto him what is haram what is halal preach unto him what is going to happen next after this world nothing nothing can enter inside that which has been blocked layers after layer by the suit of najasa my goodness we have to understand that there is a fundamental difference between the way they look at us and the way we look at us the way they look at human being and the way we look at human being from there it starts and then we have to proceed further i'll explain to you at every stage how we differ from each other we differ in our standpoint we differ in our viewpoint that is why they can't understand us i was sitting with my jewish friend once he told me i can't understand you muslims now look at the way he looks at it i say what have you done he said i can't understand a community that is whole islamic community not only our community it is the whole islamic oh my talk so i cannot understand a community which strikes it its head on the ground five times a day which strikes with its head on the ground five times a day sajda he was referring to sajda you see our people talk that what sort of community can this be when they go and strike their forehead over the ground five times in a day now they are looking at it as a striking and we are looking at it as a prostration to what is that power which cannot be matched and equal with any power on earth and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in quran has spoken about sajda there is an ayah complete ayah one after the other allah says every creation does a sajda every creation the heaven and the skies and the earth do sajda the trees do sajda and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says not only the trees but the shadow of the trees does the sajda right and then there is a small part of the ayah within this ayah of sajda which is a lesson وَمَنْ يُهِنِ اللَّهُ فَمَا لَهُ مِنْ مُكْرِمْ Whoever has been dishonored by Allah cannot be honored by anyone. That means if you don't do sajda, it will be a dishonor where you will go on bowing down before all the powers and none can give you back your honor. But if you do sajda, your honor is restored and there is no one who can dishonor. because you will bow down before no power you are a muslim he looks at it as striking we look at it as honor that we will not bow down before any power so there is a difference hijab they look at it as disgraceful hijab as imprisonment hijab as prevention hijab as medieval hijab as sign of illiteracy hijab as backwardness and what not for a lady and what do we look at it depends upon where we stand if we are in the western camp then of course it is like that come into the camp of allah and look at it and you will see that this is the honor and grace which is given to a woman and she is not deprived of her knowledge of her learning of her but this is the honor that is chastity this is virtue this is grace where somebody if somebody's mother somebody's daughter somebody's sister is honored and any stranger cannot come close by to talk the way they talk or to talk to a woman or to deal with a girl or a lady the way these westerners would do that a woman clearly i say from member today has been in the name of liberalization emancipation and freedom a degraded to nothing but a chattel of sex 
accept it or not. And it is now for a mu'mina woman to decide whether she is a Muslim and her fundamental and principles are that of Fatima. Zahra salamullah alayha. Then she will put on hijab without any scruples and will maintain that hijab and will maintain her honor. She will go to school, she will go to college, she will get the best of education, she will be enlightened, but she will be following the fundamentals of Islam. Because her view is that I have been sent by Allah for a purpose and I'm going to go back home, their ultimate reality to answer. It's not only for here that I have come to play and make merry and then die and perish. I am not going to perish. I'm going to subsist. If that is understood by a lady, there is a difference. So to which camp do we belong? And how much is the difference? That we shall be discussing, inshallah ta'ala, in the future. It will shake when I will produce all the evidences that have been printed, one after the other. It will shake us all. And for the first time, we will come to know that while we believe that we are in a rose garden around us, actually we are living in intellectual dirt and spiritual filth. May Allah save us.